So uh, yeah, first, firstly, just to introduce, uh, so Airgrid, Airgrid Group uh, comprises, is Airgrid is essentially the, the transmission system operator in Ireland. Um, and with, with Sony, the system operator of Northern Ireland, uh, together we are the, the transmission system operators on, on the island of Ireland. Um, so this picture here, this is uh, one of our operators in the, the National Control Centre in Dublin. Um, I actually haven't, this is Wayne, I haven't actually seen Wayne for over a year now because of, of COVID, so I've been working at home and uh, Wayne has been operating the power system from our um, a backup control center. So uh, just a, an impact of COVID that we've we've has been quite challenging on on operation of the system and we've had to split our, our, our operations between different control centers to minimize the risk of, of COVID. So in, in terms of what the uh, this presentation will hopefully provide you with today is an insight into how Airgrid and Sony as the TSOs, how we operate the, the system today with high levels of wind. And I, I'll give an overview of some of the day to day processes that we we run today and then also to look at uh, how we see the operation of the system evolving kind of out to out to 2030 as, as we get more wind on the system and more challenging targets. So firstly, just a quick overview of our system of this is Ireland. We're obviously a, an, we're an island, a, a, an island synchronous system. Uh, we have interconnection to Great Britain via HVDC uh, cables that run under the Irish Sea. So plus or minus 500 megawatt HVDC interconnectors. So we are we are a synchronous island. The the operating across two jurisdictions, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, but uh, it's one synchronous system, so we are interconnected uh, at AC level um, between North and South. I suppose our transmission system is ranges from 110 kV, which are the, the black lines here, the green lines are 220 kV, and the red lines are 400 kV in the south and in the north, the blue lines are 275 kV. Um, but where we are, it, it's an interconnected system, um, one synchronous system. Our peak demand kind of late last year, close to, to seven gigawatts. We have a lot of wind installed. So uh, I think about 5,600 5, at the minute and we had our a peak wind level of 4,400 uh just earlier this year uh, we have not so much solar on the system at, at this point in time and most of this is is connected in the north of ireland there's not much in in the south at the minute so that's a, a an overview of our system i suppose like many tso's around the world we've seen a, a huge increase in in the level of renewable generation being connected so you know, over this 10 year period, wind on the system has grown from, uh, and this splits it out between Ireland and Northern Ireland, but a total of about 2000 megawatts up to the, the sort of 5,500 megawatts of wind connected as, a, as of the end of last year. So this has had a huge impact on how we operate the power system. Um, and, you know, we, we do expect this trend to continue uh, through the remainder of the decade and more challenges to arise arise from that. So I'll, I'll give an overview of some of the kind of some of the day to day kind of aspects of operating the system and some of the challenges that that we have today and some of the tools that we use today to operate the system. And it probably all starts with our forecast of of wind. Um, it's a key input to, to what we do every day in the control rooms. So what what this graph is, it's, it's a, a five over a five day horizon. We get um, wind forecasts from two uh, external vendors who who kind of independently provide us with five day forecast to half hour 
granularity of what the what each wind wind farm on the system uh, will produce. So this is the total when we add up the individual forecast for each wind farm on the system. Um, uh, this is the two forecasts that we get. So a, the, a red a red line and a green line, which are the, the two different vendors that provide us with the forecast. And then the, the blue line is what actual wind does. Um, that, so this is kind of key information for us. And I suppose the question always that's asked is around accuracy of, of the forecasts and it you know, it, it really depends on on how you measure accuracy and over what time period uh, you measure it. But I, I suppose at a at a relatively high level, it's we, we think the forecasts are, are fairly ar accurate. I mean, probably in the five to ten percent accuracy type range, depending on how you measure it. Um, and in, in this illustration, which I just kind of picked when I was putting the slides together last week, um, the the two forecasts were, were were fairly aligned, which gives us good confidence that there's there's not too much uncertainty uh, in what's going to happen. But at times, the, the those forecasts can deviate uh, quite significantly, and the actual wind can deviate quite significantly. So, you know, at at times the forecast could be a hundred percent out, um, and that's kind of the real challenge. In general, on average, they're pretty good, but it's the times when when the forecasts are way out that that kind of causes us problems. So what that that forecast is a key input to a, a process we run continually in the control rooms called our scheduling and dispatch process. So scheduling is kind of the the process of planning the operation of the system through to the next day. And dispatch is kind of the real time issuing of of instructions to generators and, and control of wind farms, which I'll, I'll come to. So th these are some of the key inputs to this uh, scheduling process. And I'm sure you've talked about some of these over the, the past number of days. So the, the the wind and the photovoltaic forecast is a key input here. Uh, there's obviously the underlying demand forecast of the system, which is a lot more predictable and something, you know, that we can generally get within maybe two percent, two or three percent accuracy of, of what the demand is, because demand consumption is relatively predictable at the minute, at least. Um, we have what our interconnectors are scheduled to do, and it's kind of the market drives what the inter interconnectors do. So, for us. In total, we have plus or minus 1000 megawatts of interconnection capacity, you know, on a, on a system with a peak of of, of six six thousand megawatts. So the the interconnectors can are a big part of uh, either our production requirement or our consumption uh, requirement in, on the island of Ireland. Um, we have commercial offer data from generators and their and the technical offer offer data for generators. So so prices for for the generators coming on for incrementing and decrementing their output technical offers, which would include the the capacity of the units, their ramp rates, their uh, kind of startup times and um, their also their their kind of reserve capability curves as well. Um, we have outages on the network, so uh, the next step that I'll talk about in, in the network market management system, we have a model of the network that we're running uh, uh, DC load flows of of the network to ensure it's secure. And we, we have real time conditions of the network. So what is the actual status of the network? Uh, and we also have constraints, which I'll talk to about in the next couple of slides, which are critical kind of with with the level of wind that we have on the system there are a number of kind of key system wide constraints that we feed in and so all, all this information feeds into what we call our market management system um, and this part part of what this system does is uh, runs applications called security constrained unit commitment um, which kind of 
or and we have subsets of those called long term scheduling and real time commitment. And these are basically looking ahead up to maybe 30 hours. What with with the changes in the inputs here, so changes in demand, changes in wind, uh, and the constraint applying the constraints, we we need to be able to develop a a secure plan for operating the system over the next uh, day to 30 hours, and this determines what what say of conventional units, what units we need to have on the system. If it's high wind, we can take conventional units off. If it's low wind, we need to maybe schedule conventional units to come on, and and the conventional units can, thermal units can take you know some maybe up to twelve or fourteen hours to actually uh, come from a a cold off state to to connecting to the system and generating. So we need to look ahead uh, up to a day to be able to make those commitment decisions. And then more granular then and looking shorter term is the economic dispatch. So uh, knowing what's on the system at the minute um, and the cost of the units on the system, what what dispatch signals in terms of what changes to megawatt set points on the generators we need to make in order to keep the system secure, but also to keep it running economically. And this is continuous process which I'll illustrate in another slide that we're we're running hundreds of iterations of this process uh, every day to ensure we're keeping the system secure and economic. And what what ultimately comes out of this process is the decisions on the, the synchronization or the desynchronization of conventional units um, and the megawatt set points when when they're on what set points we dispatch them to to ensure the system is balanced and secure and economic. Um, and out, out of this, we also use this information to to manage wind on the system as well. And, and that's where um, kind of constraints kind of feed into it, as I'll kind of come to in the next couple of slides. So one, one of the, the key constraints we have we, we have developed a metric called the System Non-Synchronous Penetration Limit, SNSP, and it's defined by this equation. So it, it's essentially the amount of non-synchronous generation plus our net interconnector imports. And remember, these are HVDC imports. They're not synchronous uh, interconnections uh, over our demand and uh, net exports. So th this is a, a metric we developed just over 10 years ago to help um, help us manage and uh, capture a number of issues with with the operation of power systems as we introduce more non-synchronous generation. I'm sure a lot of the issues you've discussed over the previous days. So we we have a limit. We we 10 years ago the the limit was 50%. Uh, our current official policy on this SNSP limit is that it, it's 70 percent um, and where we actually have started a trial of of that limit up to 75 percent um, in, in April this year. So by essentially this means that up, up to 75 percent of our demand, well if, if we ignore the interconnection interconnector flows up to 75 percent of our demand can come from non-synchronous sources, which is mainly wind on our system. Now, I, I know some other TSOs use other metrics, so wind as a percentage of demand, uh, kind of ignoring the the interconnections and and it, you know the, the actual wind as a percentage of demand in our system can go up well above eighty percent. But when you you factor in the, it's important we think to factor in the interconnector uh, flows in this calculation. So not another important constraint that we have on the system is our inertia floor. Um, so uh, and that the current floor of for the inertia level on our system is about twenty is twenty three thousand megawatt seconds, and obviously this is critical to uh, maintaining the ability of our system to be able to withstand um, the loss of large infeeds to the system. 
So, you know, on our on our system, which you know has a peak of about six thousand megawatts, our largest infeed um, is of the order of five hundred megawatts. So the loss, and and that could could be an interconnector. So the loss of that a five hundred megawatt infeed on a six thousand megawatt system, which is at, at a peak of six thousand, is obviously quite a big bang to the system. So we need. Uh, kind of plenty of reserve and inertia on the system to be able to manage the resulting frequency de deviation um, and the, the rock off that results from that as well. So I, we have a, an explicit constraint on the, the rock off rate of change of frequency of our system. Um, I'm sure a lot of you be familiar with that, that equation, but uh, so our, our uh, kind of Official limit on that is uh, uh, no more than 0.5 hertz per second rate of change of frequency. But we have from from June of last year, we've been trialing a, a limit of one hertz per second um, on the system. And a, a lot of work has been done over the years to make sure that generators on the system um, can withstand rock off events up to this one hertz value that also on the distribution system, the protection settings on, on the distribution system um, have been changed from, from this lower limit of 0.5 Hertz up to one Hertz. So that, that took, you know, probably best part of five or six years of development work and working with industry to be able to raise that, that rock off limit. And we're currently operating at the higher one Hertz limit. So this means for for the loss of a large in feed on our system, we can allow a rate of change of frequency of up to to one hertz per second. And and this essentially means that we can operate or operate a bit of a, a lighter system and accommodate uh, more wind onto the system. Another key constraint is around uh, ramping. And you know, Ireland as a relatively small island at the edge of of the Atlantic does at times tend to get swamped by by large weather systems that can come sweep in off the Atlantic. You know, with our our predominant weather is the movement of of fronts from from the Atlantic in over the southwest of the country. Um. So the, the timing of those, the exact location of those weather fronts has you know, a huge impact on, on our wind production levels. Most of our wind today, the onshore wind is, is on the, the western half of the country, obviously to, to capture the wind resource that's there. Um, but it does mean because it's in a relatively small geographic area that, that single weather fronts um, and, and the impact of those can can have a big impact on on production. So part of our uh, weather, the weather forecasts or the the forecasts that we get from the external vendors provides us with un, with the level of uncertainty associated with the forecast that they provide. So in in this uh, example, th this was kind of a storm event that was approaching the country. Um, the green is kind of the central forecast, but around it we had a a, a high, a high and low um, range of possible uh, wind levels. Um, so this obviously presents a lot of uncertainty for us as the TSO in terms of uh, which forecast, what what forecast are we going to plan for in our in our scheduling process, um, and. Therefore, we 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 integrate we take the un, the uncertainty that 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 comes with that forecast, and we have developed um, kind of what we call ramping products uh, over one, three, and eight hour timeframes, which uh, you know allow us to call on <clears throat> uh, resources to be able to ramp up uh, quickly should should uh, the forecast be below what we think it's going to be. So in this example, say at peak, the peak of the day for us around 1800 hours, we may be forecasting 
our, our demand forecast might be 5,000 megawatts, and we we believe from from the addition of wind from the central forecast plus the conventional generation that we have that we can meet that pink peak. But then if we factor in, you know, that the wind could be maybe 500 megawatts or 1,000 megawatts lower, we need to be able to have the backup conventional generation available to deal with that uncertainty. So earlier in the day, say at, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, we look forward three hours and, and kind of decide question, do we have enough uh, in reserve, in, in ramping capability to be able to deal with this level of uncertainty over the peak um, of the day? So again, this, this is a process that's running continuously, looking at the uncertainty, looking at the ramping capability that we need to be able to ensure that we can deal with that in uncertainty in our scheduling process. So th those constraints, um, along with the other inputs, uh, form inputs to our um, market management system and the the unit commitment in the economic dispatch tools that we we run. So this, what this is illustrating is kind of some of the detail within the market management system of of the applications that we run and the time frames over which we run them. And it, and this is a continuous process. Um, so we start with our real time dispatch of the system, which is looking ahead just an hour or so based on what what it takes a snapshot of what's currently on the system. Uh, so state estimation of what what is what units are currently on and what wind and demand currently is looks forward an hour um, and inform advises us on the the dispatch decisions that we need to make to be over that hour period to be able to remain secure to be able to uh, to 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 operate econ economically as well and this application runs every five minutes. Um, based on the latest information available to us looking ahead in our. We, we then also have what we call our real time commitment. Um, a tool which is looking ahead four hours. It runs every 15 minutes and it's able to it, it as well. In addition to what the individual megawatt set point is on units, it's able to make decisions about the commitment of units, i.e. which units should be on or which units should be off, uh, assuming that they can come on or off. So it generally short notice units, say hydro units, pump storage units, um, open cycle gas turbines that can generally come on in that, that time frame. And then our, our next step is kind of our, our long term schedule. So this is looking essentially looks ahead through to the end of the next day. So, you know, up to maybe I think it's 29 hours ahead. It it will look. It runs every four hours and it's really advising us based on the long long term demand forecast, long term wind forecast. What is our plan of scheduling unit commitment decisions that we need to make? Uh, again, to remain secure, to remain e economic uh, based on the latest information uh, that we have available to us. So all, all these systems are continuously running. I think in total, there's probably a, a couple of hundred economic dispatch or unit commitment uh, optimizations run each day that inform the operator as to the decisions they make in terms of commitment of generation and dispatch of, of generation, both conventional and and wind. So ba based on on that output, then this kind of gives an overview of, of some of the controls that we have of of wind in in real time from our from our uh, TSO control centers. So we, we have a control of so this this kind of applies to any any wind farm that's above five megawatts, whether transmission or distribution connected. So we can control the megawatt set point 
of that wind farm. Um, we can turn frequency response in the wind farms on and off. We can adjust the, we can select either a wide or narrow frequency dead band on the wind farms. For the transmission connected wind farms, uh, we can set the reactive power control mode from voltage control, uh, a pure sort of reactive power set point control or power factor uh, control. And then we can actually set the, the voltage or Q or uh, power factor set point on the wind farms. So that the, the reactive capabilities generally apply just to transmission connected wind farms but the, the megawatt control and the frequency response also apply to distribution connected wind farms that are above five megawatts. So what from, from that control, what, what we get is the ability to constrain and curtail the wind. So, um, you know, when, when some of those uh, system limits are hit, SNSP or if we have a rock off, issue if we anticipate a rock off issue we can constrain or curtail the wind to be able to reduce the collective output of either all wind on the island or individual wind farms uh, we can with with the frequency response we can enable we get frequency response from from the wind turbines um, and we you know we we enable this this tighter dead band this 15 millihertz uh, dead band at, at times to be able to get enough frequency response on the system as as especially during high levels of wind on the system when we're operating with not much conventional generation left and traditionally the conventional generation has provided our frequency response so as we as we lose that capability the wind farms uh, essentially can replace that and provide uh, an element of frequency response and we can also then we again similar issue with with the displacement of the conventional generation and the reactive power capability that that traditionally provided uh, we can use the the reactive power capability of wind farms to support the the voltage on the network so th this table is a, a list of the 14 system services that we have in operation in our in our market. Um, so the, these are services, you know, non well outside of the energy market. The services that we as TSO look to procure from service providers, um, be it conventional units, be it demand side units, or or wind farms. So I've ticked here which of these services we, we currently, which wind, wind can provide services for, and we currently contract um, individual wind farms for the provision of the frequency response services uh, that I mentioned just before, and um, also for provision of reactive power service, and um, specifically steady state reactive power service at the minute. Uh, the two that I've ast asterisked here are more dynamic reactive power services that we currently we have, we have conceptual um, products developed for those, but we're not currently contracting um, for those services at the minute. But wind will we expect wind to be able to provide those uh, when we actually identify that we need to start uh, procuring those services. So. Wind, wind can provide a, a lot of the capability that we need, you know, that that, you know, as, as we know, wind is displacing the conventional generation and um, but it is able to to provide many of the services that uh, conventional generators used to be able to provide, although obviously not not everything. Well, not everything at this point in time. Uh, I, I suppose one of the main challenges that we have with wind on the system at the minute is, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> predominantly our, 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 the vast majority of our wind resources are onshore wind farms on the western half of the country, so that they benefit from the, the weather fronts moving in from the Atlantic. Um, so relatively speaking, in a 
in a fairly uh, confined geographic space. Uh, uh, traditionally, like our for those maybe not familiar with our our power system, predominantly our our large load centres uh, are on the east coast, Belfast and Dublin here. Um, so traditionally, our system was designed with you know conventional generation closer to the load centres. Uh, on the east coast, but now with with wind connecting, those generators are are running less. We've more wind and power being generated on the west. So getting that power from the west coast to the east coast it pre presents challenges when when there's obviously challenges with building transmission infrastructure uh, on the system. So we have quite a few thermal and voltage related uh, transmission constraint groups. So um, th this kind of illustrates some of those those binding uh, transmission constraint groups, some some impacted by outages on the system. So we um, I, when I come to talking about some of the tools, we have a what we call our wind dispatch tool that has these uh, constraint groups defined in it. So all the wind farms in a particular Group. I'm just calling out this this group that feeds into into Galway here. All the wind farms in that area, which total up to maybe close to 300 megawatts, um, are defined in a constraint group in our wind dispatch tool. So if we see an issue with a, a a thermal loading on the line or the amount of power coming out of this group, we can apply a, cons a constraint to all the wind farms in that group. The pro rata reduces the output of, of those wind farms. So yeah, so that that's the what uh, kind of a, a snapshot of the wind dispatch tool that we have. So this has, as I as I mentioned earlier, we, we have direct um, megawatt set point control of all wind farms above five megawatts on the system. So they're all their control of those are all integrated into our wind dispatch tool. So we can select uh, the particular one, one of these constraint groups or a number of those constraint groups. Um, we, we set an amount by which we want the wind in that group to be reduced by. So say we want it reduced from 250 megawatts to 200 megawatts. We ask for a 50 megawatt reduction in the output of those wind farms. And the tool calculates pro rata across all the wind farms in that group the new set point and issues the new set point to the individual wind farms to get our total output down to 200 megawatts. So we can do that for individual groups, but we can also do it for the whole, uh, essentially the whole system as well. So if we have, if we're coming up against, say, uh, uh, close to 75% SNSP on the system and the wind is continuing to increase, we can we can select essentially every wind farm in the country and apply a say 100 megawatt reduction in the collective output of the, all those wind farms. The tool calculates the individual set point of each wind farm and issues it to the wind farm control system. And we get our 100 megawatt reduction pro rata across the entire system. So this is a really powerful tool um, and very important to us in the, the control centers. Um, another Kind of key tool um, that is is kind of recently been introduced is our look ahead stability assessment tool or LSAT. Um, so there was a previous version of this called uh, our wind stability assessment tool WSAT that looked at uh, essentially provided online real time stability dynamic stability assessment of the system and this is run in this is kind of on the desk in the control room run by our control engineers but we've now introduced a look ahead element to it so it's looking ahead up to 10 hours what the system conditions will be taking the output from the market management system um, as to what what future conditions will be and it's performing a full uh, voltage and transient stability analysis of the system to, you know, basically to inform us: are we secure or not secure in that look-ahead time frame? And um, so that, that that's recently introduced. It's a very 
a critical tool for us to inform us that or to assure us that we're continuing to run the system securely and to flag any look ahead issues that we might have on the system. So where, where are we today in terms of operation? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, we have our official policy on SNSP is we're up at 70%, but we're trialling 75% at the minute. This kind of illustrates the evolution of SNSP over the over the, the previous six, seven years. So we have that's gradually gone up and we expect it to continue to, to increase as I'll I'll come to in a second. Um so really we're we're kind of at a, a pivot point at the minute in terms of our operation of the system. So I so suppose maybe some of you might be aware kind of 10 years or so ago we started on on this kind of program called our, our DS3 program. The aim of which was to get up to this 75% SNSP limit on the system and um, to be able to allow us to achieve our renewable energy targets of, of 40% uh, renewables um, on the electricity system by 2020. So we've kind of achieved that objective now and now we're kind of commencing the process <clears throat> of you know working out how we're going to be able to raise this SNSP limit even further ultimately up to as close to 100 percent as as we can get it so we're starting that bit of work now which is kind of why this is indicated as a a red zone at the minute that you know we're we're going to hold when we get once we complete the 75 percent trial we're probably going to hold at that position at that limit for a number of years while we develop our, our capability and, and that we need to be able to progress further into this this red zone. And by way of illustration, so in February there was a week or 10 days or so in February that were were very windy here. So this is from the 10th of February through to the 22nd of of uh, February this year. And our the SS, SNSP limit limit on the system was consistently up at the 70% uh, limit for a very high percentage of, of that period. So this was before we started our 75% our trial in April. Um, but we, you know, we're this compared to where we started 10 years ago, this is, um, you know, to be able to operate it up at this high level on a on a continuous basis for long periods of time gives give us a lot of confidence in in how far we've got um, and our the ability of the tools etc to be able to uh, safely ensure that we can operate it at these high levels of of wind. So that's where we are today. I talk, I have a couple of slides now, just maybe outlining where we're going in in the future. And uh, as I said, kind of the, the 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 previous phase of work um, was to take us up to kind of where we are today, which is forty percent uh, renewables on the system, which is kind of mostly coming from wind by twenty twenty. But our our current government targets uh, see that increasing to seventy percent of our electricity production coming from re renewable sources by 2030. Um, so for maybe for the, those that are not familiar, in, we don't have that much hydro generation in Ireland. Maybe it's sort of three or four percent of our production comes from hydro. <clears throat> so really the majority of, of this uh, re renewable generation is is wind with, with some solar at the minute. So th this is what we kind of see expect to happen over the next to, to the remainder of the decade that we get about 10 gigawatts of onshore and offshore wind and solar development. Uh, on the demand side then electrification of kind of domestic heating with heat pumps, uh, rollout of electric vehicles on the system, connection of large energy users which are predominantly data centers on our system. So we, we seem in Ireland to have attracted lots of uh, large data centers um, onto the system and we expect that to, to add a lot of demand to our system over the coming years. Uh, and on the transmission side, well, you know, 
associated with the offshore wind uh, will be the operation of offshore grids. And we have two new HVDC in interconnectors arriving. Um, one that's going to be 500 megawatts uh, connection to, to another one to, to Great Britain and a 700 megawatt um, called the Celtic interconnector that's uh, connecting Ireland to France around the 2026-2027 uh, time frame. So a lot of things going to be changing over the next the next number of years. Um, and as I'm sure you're all aware and I've been talking about, this will bring lots lots more challenges for us in the operation of, of the power system. Um, so based on our experience of the previous 10 years and getting to where we are today, we have a lot of, lot of understanding of what these issues are, but new issues and maybe more extreme issues will, will arise for us in terms of uh, the path forward. So some analysis that we've done looking at um, system conditions in, in 2030. So this, I'll, I'll talk through this a bit. This is kind of a, a model of um, uh, system conditions in 2030 with 70% of, of our energy coming from uh, re renewable sources <clears throat> and what it means basically for some of the limits that I, or some of the constraints that I mentioned earlier. So starting with inertia, what what this is kind of what this is illustrating is that the red star is our limit today, 23,000 megawatt seconds. But to be able to integrate more wind on the system, this this analysis is showing, and it, it's kind of a, a production analysis of every, I think it's every hour over a year of where the system, what the system conditions would be, where we'd be operating. And what it indicated is that we need, predominantly the system would need to operate at this much lower inertia level uh, to be able to accommodate the, the additional wind that's operating on it. So we need to be able to uh, reduce the inertia of the system uh, further to be able to accommodate that that wind. On, on Rockoff then, as I mentioned earlier, like our, our official kind of policy on on rock off is 0.5 hertz per second but we are we have trial we are trialing that at one hertz per second um, and what the analysis kind of shows is that you, you absolutely need to operate at this much higher level of rock off on the system because predominantly with a lot of wind and a, quite a light system you're going to be experiencing or operating in rock off rock offs in in that range so we're kind of at the gold star at the minute, but we absolutely need need to be able to to stay there into the future. And then on on the SNSP limit, so currently seventy percent trialing seventy five percent at the minute, but the analysis shows we need to be getting <clears throat> that up to as close to to as close to I'd say a hundred percent um as as we can get uh, to be able to again, to be able to accommodate all this wind on the system. And then a fourth fourth limit that we have, I didn't mention earlier, but we have a, a, a rule at the minute that we have to have eight large uh, conventional generators on the system. So either large combined cycle gas turbines or oil or coal units um, on the system for system stability purposes. But we need to be able to reduce that, you know, to essentially to make make more room for wind to be able to uh, connect onto the system. Um, so th what this is telling us is, is that um, we need to evolve, or we need to be able to um, adjust these constraints that we have today to be able to relax them to be able to accommodate uh, more wind on the system. And so we're kind of, uh, as we kind of have reached the milestone of 75% um, SNSP at the minute, we're now evolving to the next phase of work that we need to do to be able to get uh, SNSP up, up closer to 100% on the system. So we're starting a, a, a body of work now that's going to be looking at how we evolve SNSP over the remainder of the decade. 
we're kind of notionally targeting that by 2025 we'll be up at 85 percent snsp and there may be some increments uh, from the current value of of 75 percent today uh, along the way to get there um, and i suppose in, in doing that we need need to be able to reduce our dependency on conventional generation uh, for the services and the energy that the system needs and rely more on uh, the renewable generation that we're connecting, you know, supported with demand management, uh, storage capability, maybe synchronous condensers on the system and other technologies uh, to, to be evolved over the time. So we've, this is my final slide now. So we've, we've recently uh, consulted on kind of our this plan for the future and the work that we need to do in, in a document called Shaping Our Electricity Future. And this spans area of, uh, I've, I suppose I've focused on uh, system operations here today, but there's other aspects to it that I'm sure you'll appreciate around the, how the market development, how the market developments, how the network itself developments, develops to be able to alleviate the constraints on the network. So that there was a consultation on that. It, it closed earlier in the week, but the document is, which with quite a bit of technical detail in it is available on our website. Uh, should you have any sort of interest in looking at our, our at our plans going forward. Um, so that that's kind of it operations today and where, where we're heading into the future. So. Yeah, any questions or pan back to Damien? Thank you, Simon. Very interesting. I will now open the floor uh, for questions. And maybe while people are thinking, I'll begin with a question myself. Um, you talked about how you had the capability of sort of externally controlling uh, frequency control capabilities and voltage modes and, and so on. I, I was wondering how often are you are you actually switching modes or is it is it sort of a, just an emergency sort of capability whenever you're getting to those very high SNSP levels? So uh, on on the reactive power control modes, it generally our our kind of preferred mode of operation is in voltage voltage control mode. So we, we set a voltage set point um, and but we so it it tends to be they stay in, in voltage control mode, but we do change the set point, you know, depending on the system conditions through the day. So, you know, at day during the day, we tend to operate the system with a higher voltage and bring it bring it down at night. So we the mode doesn't change, but the, the set point uh, changes. Um, and on the on the frequency uh, response, so Generally, frequency response remains on the wind farms, and what what changes occasionally is the the dead band. So, I suppose in normal in normal conditions, the the 200 millihertz dead band is applied. I mean, predominantly we're trying to maximise the amount of wind being produced, so we don't want it downward regulating. Uh, but it, it it gets to a point maybe where there's when the conventional generation is pulled back to its absolute minimum, um, or we've minimized the number of conventional units on the system, that we need the wind to help us regulate system frequency. So in, on those occasions, and it, you know, this would happen fairly regularly that we'd apply the 15 millihertz dead band, like that it could happen any time where we're relatively high wind conditions. And uh, again, we have the the tools themselves allow us to you know it's it's essentially a click of a couple of bu buttons that allow us to send that out to to all the wind farms um, yeah so it is it is actively they are actively used okay okay thank you uh we have a question from chitaranjan uh hi seven uh thank you so much for the uh presentation so i have a few questions. Uh, first one is, uh, do you have a real-time uh, system to monitor uh, inertia in the system, uh, in, in the I system? Uh, very topical question for us. Um, so 
the answer is no. We 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 have a a fairly simplistic uh, approach whereby we add up the inertia constants of of the online transmission connected generators. So the the inertia floor value that I mentioned, the twenty three thousand uh, megawatt seconds. You know, we, we we monitor. We just simply based on what's online at the minute, we add up the, the contribution of those generators and ensure that we remain above that twenty three thousand. Now, only yesterday we we were talking to a company that I think has been involved in with National Grid and GB. Um, in into uh, technologies. Is yeah. it, is it the one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we were aware of kind of that that technology, and I suppose the, the question were, I think the benefit for National Grid is being able to capture the the additional inertia of of the dist of of I of plant on the distribution system, um. So that the, the, I think the concept is that you might get ten or thirty percent. You might actually have ten or thirty percent more inertia on the system than than you think you have. And that would allow you to um, maybe take some of the convent the, the larger units off. Um, but I, I I suppose what we're we're debating internally, you know, on our system, we we don't we don't have a lot a lot of big industry on on the Irish power system. So, you know, we are probably just need to understand a bit more what what do we think the inertia contribution from the distribution system would be? Is it significant enough? To, to change how we operate, but yeah, so we, we're, we're aware yeah. of that 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 technology and are, are looking into it at the minute. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think uh, the UK system has uh, a little bit more than 10% from load side. So yeah, I think I think that uh, makes a lot of sense to uh, monitor in real time. Uh, one other thing uh, you have uh, mentioned in one of the tables or uh, throughout your uh, presentation that uh, fast frequency response is one of the uh, services that you currently have from wind turbine generators. Uh, what about uh, inertial response? Have you? Uh, I mean, is it is it is it a, a service that you have thought about it, or is it going to come uh, in in the near future? Yeah, I, th I think it will evolve. I mean, it, as you see here, we we have specifically called our inertia service a synchronous inertial response. Um, so it is only provided by synchronous generators currently, um, but ob obviously there's um, uh, there's synthetic. We're aware of kind of the concept of syn synthetic inertial response um, being provided by non-synchronous sources, and I think that is something as part of our, our our next stage of development of services that that we're going to be going to need to look at. Uh, so, did you have like maybe any trial projects for synthetic inertia from wind, or is it still uh, something that the commercial uh, partner is supposed to uh, maybe provide uh, from their side? Yeah, I, I, I believe we did have. I know maybe a couple of years ago we did have a trial of uh, synthetic inertia from uh, a wind farm. I'm, I'm not actually sure what stage that is at at the minute, but we, I, we, we did. Trial it. If you if you want to drop me an email, maybe I can I can uh, find out just where that is at the minute. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If if there is any report or anything, that'll be really great. Uh, one last question. Uh, so you talked about in one of the slides uh, a look ahead uh, stability tool. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm I'm just trying to understand what kind of tool is it? Is it a simulation of uh, a reduce order simulation of the system, or is it? Uh, can you please explain a little bit, uh, if possible, uh, on this? So, yeah, I mean, it 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 basically from from the real time system, it takes a we we get a state estimation of the real of the real time condition of the power system. So, a full network model, full state yeah. estimation, um, and there's a real time element to it. So, it, it's then applying, it, it's doing a full. Um, Sort of quasi quasi dynamic uh, voltage stability assessment, but also a full full transient stability assessment. 
So we have all the dynamic models of the generators, of the loads, of interconnectors, of all the devices connected to the system. So it's it's doing a full transient stability, stability assessment to inform us. Basically, the main thing we're probably interested in at the minute is what what's the frequency nadir going to be, or the frequency zenith, and what is the rock off going to be if if we simulate the loss of the largest infeed to the system. So it's presenting. Tell it's basically it will it will alarm if it if it thinks we're going outside our frequency limits or rock off limits. So it's doing that based on a real time system conditions. But the the development of it that we've just introduced is then it it has a look ahead snapshot of the system. So what will wind be in five hours time? What will demand be? What what network conditions might have changed? So what outages of transmission lines might might have happened in five five hours time and it's perfor performing the same uh, voltage and transient stability analysis yeah so it, it's yeah. quite a powerful yeah. tool um and really important to us as as we kind of push the push the boundaries and push the limits um further yeah uh maybe an additional question a small additional question to this uh I, I guess it's still not a reality, but uh, some of the power systems like AEMO, or I'm not sure who we saw power systems in the world. Uh, probably they are thinking of maybe having a digital twin, like a EMT model of the whole system. So is the Iris power system also planning something uh, towards that direction? Maybe uh, people are predicting maybe around three or four years it will take that much time. Uh, I am not really sure about the timeline of other uh, power systems, but do you, do you also have a plan of uh, having uh, such a kind of like a, a, a real time analysis tool? I, I'd say we, we don't have uh, for any firm plans on of that at the minute. We're, <clears throat> we're certainly talking to other TSOs like AMO about and, and comparing kind of what our development plans on tools are for the future. Um, <clears throat> there's obviously a, a big overhead to, to develop uh, this this kind of modeling capability uh, and a big sort of step increase in the processing capability that that's needed to manage it. But we certainly uh, it it's on our list of things that we of tool developments that we need to look into. But we've no firm plans on that at the minute. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's all the question I had. Thank Great. You. Thanks. Good questions. Thank you. Yeah, it reminds me, I think uh, Julia Maria Vosgian was speaking on Wednesday and, and she was saying that they, I suppose you could say that they had this digital twin, but it took them a, a couple of hours to run a single fault or simulate a single fault. So, uh, yeah, the, the technology is getting there, but it it, uh, it needs to improve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Mustafa, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi Damon, and uh, thank you, Simon, for this presentation. I have one follow-up question regarding the synthetic energy provision of the wind turbines. As uh, I think, in, based on your uh, presentation, there is a need for measurement of Rockoff and also the dead band of frequency. Uh, if we want to put the synthetic energy into practice, uh, uh, how much time is needed for the measurements and sending the signals to the wind turbines to participate? Is there any standard for this? Uh, uh, synthetic energy provision. It, um, I'd, I'd say at the minute, no, it, it's not something that we have defined a, a, any standard for. We haven't developed a a service or a product that that defines that um, that the, the speed of response uh, uh, yet. Um, but it, so I, yeah, no, I, 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 I don't know if if. If any others on the call might be able to answer that better or experience from elsewhere, but um, yes, yes, uh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe I, I could yeah. jump in for a moment, um, just to help Simon. Perhaps I think uh, whenever people are talking about synthetic inertia, I think uh, they might be referring to what Ireland calls the fast frequency response, which Ireland has, and as you've as you've ticked there, wind can actually provide. So if you want to talk about wind in the context of fast frequency response. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, so as stated in, in the table here, the, the fast frequency response is um, 
was developed prior to having fast frequency our, our fastest reserve kind of category was primary operating reserve which which kind of requires delivery in five seconds so the fast frequency response reduced that down to two seconds but in in reality there's <clears throat> additional kind of incentives if if you can reduce that i think it's down to we have maybe response down to 200 milliseconds if you can get deliver your frequency response in 200 milliseconds you know the 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 arrangements are there there's more attractive kind of payments for the service if you can do it quicker than the 2 seconds but right. i suppose we're we're still not considering i'm not sure do we consider that a sort of synthetic inertial response or is there something even quicker than that that could happen i'm i'm not sure yet yeah, uh, because the fast frequency response uh, should uh, occur very fast. For example, if you go from uh, 0 0.5 hertz per second of Rockoff measurement or threshold to 1 hertz per second, if the measurement takes time and sending signal to wind turbine takes maybe time more than uh, 300 millisecond, that would be too late and we would have uh, a deeper uh, frequency nadir, in my opinion. Yeah. And uh, I, I was told that uh, zero point, uh, sorry, 300 millisecond would be uh, good enough uh, for sending the signal, but I'm not sure about this data. Yeah. I, I, I th I'm guessing, Mustafa, you're talking about some centralized control that mm -hmm. whenever it sees an event, it, it sends signals to generators around the system to say, please switch your, your mode. Uh, is that what you're right. suggesting? Yes, like uh, measuring the rock off and deviation in frequency and then sending the signals to switch on the frequency response or participate in fast frequency response for each wind turbine or the designated wind turbine. I'm guessing, if, unless Simon wants the answer, is I'm guessing what Airgood would want to do is that, particularly based on their stability assessment tool or their uh, the forecast assessment, they would actually switch that service on in advance so that if they see that uh, the system could be at risk if there is a, a generator loss, for example, that that capability would be previously enabled as opposed yeah. to relying on real time communications, which is obviously a, a risky thing to do. Yeah, I, I think like we I don't think we we don't envisage any form of centralized switch on off of this you know it, it it's assen essentially the measurement needs to happen locally for to achieve these kind of very fast responses so it's there isn't a sort of centrally dispatched deliver fast frequency response now type of control envisaged it, i think we the mode is on or off kind of in advance but the actual uh, triggering of the response is all through local measurement and activation. Right, right. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, maybe I can just finish up with one, one final question, which is that um, you talked about your stability assessment tool and the ability to uh, curtail remotely. I'm just wondering where the, the human in the loop sits in this process is the human still extremely important or is the human being phased out yeah no Wayne who I showed at the start still will still have a job I think in 10 <laughs> years time <laughs> um so I mean the the output like the the dispatch decision is ultimately determined by the operator on the desk base so the the tools provide advice you know they they provide indicative schedules indicative dispatch instructions we in ireland we still have the concept of a centrally dispatched system so it's an operator on a desk that's that's issuing it now they have there's automated tools the, the instructions are issued electronically the wind dispatch tool allows us to dispatch hundreds of individual wind farms you know with a click of a couple of buttons but it, it's essentially still the operator deciding what what the what what the megawatt set point the collective kind of reduction should be 
So they, they, I think the operator is still at the heart of it. Now whether, and you know, I, I think probably we will evolve towards more automation into the future. And maybe the operator is a bit more hands off and, and supervising these systems, still able to, to step in if required. But I, yeah, I think we do. Part of part of our plan to 2030 is is what we call our control center of the future project, which is looking at what tools and capability we need to, for the operators on the desk uh, to be able to operate the system. But I think they'll they'll keep their jobs. Uh, but uh, uh, and but I think we expect the systems. I think given the volume of additional wind and other resources connecting to the system, it probably needs to automate, continue to automate, be automated a bit more. Um, but still, with the operator supervising it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so 